All right, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Exodus chapter 25? We're going to start there. We're going to be picking up with the, on, the, fourth, the fifth and the sixth visions of Zechariah here this morning. As you're turning to Exodus 25, just be thinking about the world that we live in and all the fallenness that is around us and all the conflict and the death and the distortion of all that God has said is good. Think about all of those things. We have in our world today entire industries and technologies that are dedicated to protecting ourselves from ourselves. We protect our assets, we protect our privacy, we protect our information, we protect all of those things. We invest billions and billions of dollars a year in secure communications and firewalls and things like that. And to us, that's normal. That appears perfectly normal. Since the fall in Genesis chapter 3, we have no other experience than that. Our sin has polluted what God created as good. Indeed, mankind and all of creation is groaning under the weight of our original sin. And we see that all around us today. But one day all of this will come to an end. And that is good news. That is really good news. Uh, Today's message is going to contain two pieces, two visions that are part of that process. They're going to help us gain some clarity on what is in front of us. We have vision five, which is a vision of a golden lampstand. And we have vision six, which is a vision of a flying scroll. The golden lampstand is going to help us understand how Christ mediates or how he propagates God's glory in this world, this fallen world. Vision six about the flying scroll is God's judgment of the rebellious Jew and by extension to all of the world. So we'll be looking at those things. Uh, We have two pieces of material for you today outside of your Bible. Um, They're very useful. I hope they're helpful. One is the outline that's on the church website of what we're going to be going through today. But we also have a cross-reference file on the the church website. And the purpose for that is to give you a little bit more of the details of the cross-references that are made that I make reference to from within our passage. So those are both available to you for your assistance as we go through this. Let's take a look at the golden lampstand um, in Zechariah chapter 4. Um, we're going to be there looking there in chapters 1 through 14, verses 1 through 14. But let's start in Exodus 25. We're going to be looking at the golden lampstand. This is the lampstand that God gave Israel during the time of Moses. This was a lampstand that was going to be used in the tabernacle. And it was going to be used in the temple later when Solomon built the temple. And the purpose of this lampstand was to illuminate the holy place. It was one of the pieces of furniture in the holy place. I have it up there for you. We want to make sure we understand a little bit about this lampstand because that'll help us understand and give us proper perspective on what Zechariah sees when we get to our passage. If you look down in verse 31 of Genesis 25, you'll notice that the lampstand is made of pure gold and it has a a base with it and it has a, a center shaft and you can see that and it also has cups and bulbs and flowers. And this gold material was meant to remind Israel of God's presence that was going to dwell among them as a people. You look at verse 32, you notice that there's six branches. There's three on each side, one on one, three on one side and three on the other. And then there is a lamp at the top of each branch. I don't have that in the picture you're looking at, but you see a, a small bowl at the top. There would be a lamp that was put in that and there would be oil that was put in that. If you drop down to Exodus chapter 27, look at verse 20, we can understand how it is that this lampstand remains lit. God says to Moses, you shall command the sons of Israel that they bring you clear oil of beaten olives for the light to make a lamp burn continually. So we could say a lot about the lampstand, but for the purposes of our time this morning, we want to see that it it provides light for the holy place. It's made of gold. It has six branches, and each one of those branches has a lamp on it, and the Levites were to to do the work of keeping it burning. They were to bring a continual supply of oil to that. So let's turn away from that, and now with that in mind, let's see what Zechariah sees. We're going to be looking at a glorious light in the first three verses of Zechariah chapter 4. Let me read the first three verses. 
Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was roused from his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with its bowl on top of it and seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also two olive trees beside it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. So if we look at verse 2, we see that Zechariah sees a lampstand all of gold. Zechariah is a priest. He's familiar with a gold lampstand. That's nothing new to him. He understands that. But immediately following that is where we begin to see the differences that show up. You notice that there is a bowl on top of the lampstand. This bowl is a repository. It's distinct from the other lamp. It actually holds oil. And it keeps the lamps continually filled with the oil. So what you have in mind here is this supply there. You can see it above in the picture. It, it, the bowl sits above the lampstand. And it represents a continuous, abundant supply of this oil. So that's the first distinction between Zechariah's lampstand and the lampstand that was in the temple and in the tabernacle for all of those years. The second thing you notice in verse 2, as you look down, you notice that there are seven lamps, and each one of those lamps contains seven spouts to each of the lamps which are on top of it. So this is talking about a supply that is perfect. You notice that there's the, lamp, the bowl there, and each one of those bowls has seven spouts coming out of it, and those seven groups of seven spouts go into each one of those seven lamps that are at the top. This describes the perfection of the supply. The first thing what you see with the bowl is the abundant supply. This relates to the perfection of the supply. There are seven individual tubes that go from the bowl to each one of the seven lampstands. So there's a perfect supply. There's no possibility for human error here, none whatsoever. And then we learn a little bit more about the supply of oil as we get to verse 3. You see that also there are two olive trees by it, one on the right side and one on the other, on the left side. Olive trees are, are trees which live to be very old, thousands and thousands of years old. And they bear fruit all of their lifetime. It takes them a few years to get to the place where they're fruit bearing, but they continue to provide fruit that produces oil throughout their thousands of years of lifetime. What this helps us see is that there is an endless supply so you have an abundant supply, you have a perfect supply, and you have an endless supply. So you see that Zechariah's lampstand was different from the lampstand that was in the temple and in the tabernacle. It was actually superior to it. It was, it was a better lampstand. And the reason why was it was self-sufficient. Its supply was abundant, and it was perfect, and it was endless. The temple lampstand was a, a perfect picture for Israel of God's presence. It was made of gold, so they understood God's holiness. It was right there for them. It was all about God's presence. There was nothing lacking whatsoever for God's intended purpose as it relates to his presence through the temple lampstand. But Zechariah's lampstand points to something more than God's presence only. It points in addition to God's presence to God's glory. Specifically, it relates to God's ability to take his glory and propagate his glory throughout the world. So what we have here is a, a very, very powerful lamp. A lamp with a perfect supply, an endless supply, an ongoing supply. It can never be extinguished. And what we're going to see is this points to one person. That person is Christ himself. I'd like to make reference to Isaiah 49, verse 6. This is where we start to see an Old Testament reference to Christ as light. The Father is speaking to the Son in Isaiah 49. In verse 6, he says, I will give you as a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach them to the ends of the earth. The light of the gospel will be given to the Gentiles, and in the millennial kingdom, Christ is that light. Jesus speaks as well of his own light. He is rebuking the Pharisees in John chapter 8 when they caught this woman supposedly in adultery. And he speaks to them and he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. 
That is Christ's testimony to us, that he himself is the light. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. He's writing to them in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and he speaks of Christ. And he says, the God of this age, that would be Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So this is God's purpose for the millennial kingdom, his Messiah son, establishing his presence in Jerusalem and propagating and furthering his glory throughout the whole world. We think about this for a second, we back away from this, all of the corruption and all of the fallenness and all of the brokenness in this world, it characterizes just about every part of our life as we see it. We locked the doors on our cars before we came in here this morning. At least I hope we did. We have a security team that stands at the front of the, the door protecting us and helping us. It's all around us. Um, all of this fallenness will be overrun with the glory of Jesus Christ. Sometimes glory gets, uh, it's undersold, it gets a bad rap. What is taking place here is Jesus is going to overrun all of the brokenness of this world with his glory and he will make all things right. That's pretty exciting for us, except the problem here in Zechariah's time was that Jerusalem was in ruins. So he's got this wonderful vision in front of him, but Jerusalem is in ruins. And he starts to wonder how it is that Jerusalem is actually going to be rebuilt. And that's where the next part of the vision comes in. So let's read verses four and following. We're going to read through verse seven. Then I answered and said to the angel who was speaking me, with me, saying, what are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered and spoke to me saying, this is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of hosts. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Here is where Zechariah begins to gain some clarity on what is being represented by this lampstand and how it will actually take place. And it starts with the temple, but it zooms out from there. In verse four, Zechariah says, what are these, my Lord? He understands the bigger picture of the rebuilt temple and he understands the picture of, of a rebuilt Jerusalem. He knows the importance of that, but he doesn't really see the relationship between those things and this lampstand that he sees in front of him. And so the angel speaks and says, this is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel. So the first thing we need to do is make sure we're clear on who Zerubbabel is. First, you have to be able to say his name. Then you need to be able to understand who he is. I stumbled over it all week long. All right, let's go back a few pages to Haggai chapter 2, verse 21, near the very end of the book. This is so helpful. Again, we need to remember that Haggai was contemporary with Zerubbabel. He was contemporary with Zechariah too. Um, they, were, they were contemporaries, so they're speaking together. And this is what Haggai says in chapter 2, verse 21. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. So God's message that he is going to shake the heavens and the earth is what Haggai needs to speak to Zerubbabel but he's the governor of Judah. He was the, the, the person who held the highest level of office amongst all of the Jews who returned to the promised land from Babylon. But he wasn't just any governor. We need to understand this well. Let's take a look, a couple of pages to the right. Let's go to Matthew chapter one and see where Zerubbabel actually sits in the genealogy of Christ. Matthew chapter one, verse 12. And Matthew opens his gospel account with the genealogy of Jesus. He starts way back at the fathers and he moves forward to Jesus. And right in the middle, let's see who we find. Verse 12, after the deportation to Babylon, that's the context we're working with here, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel and Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. So even though he was not a king over Israel because there was no king at this time, Zerubbabel was a direct descendant of Christ himself. So what we have in here in front of us is assurance from God to Jewish royalty. So God is speaking to someone who is in the line of Christ 
And what does he say in verse six? He says, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit. And in the Hebrew, the word might there is speaking of personal resources, assets, what you have in your own wherewithal. And power is speaking of your own personal strength. And so God says, I'm gonna accomplish something very massive here. We are gonna rebuild this temple with all of the adversaries that are in view, but I'm gonna do it. And it's gonna have nothing to do with your own might. And it's gonna have nothing to do with your own power. And that's evident. The Jews were surrounded by all of these adversaries. And you can read more about it as you read Ezra's account of the rebuilding of the temple. They were outnumbered. Everybody who was opposed to them had more resources. They had more money. They had more history in the land, all of those things. But look at the beginning of verse seven and see what God continues to say. He says, what are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. When you're reading about mountains in your Bible, a lot of times what you're looking at is a, a declaration of something that is big and strong, and it's a security, and it's a place where you go to meet with God. That's not what it's in view here. What is in view here is an obstacle. It's an obstacle that's completing the Jew, preventing the Jews from completing the temple. So we have an, an obstacle in view. And God says, what are you? He's speaking directly to these adversaries who are opposing the rebuilding of the temple, and they've been successful at it for 16 years. The foundation was laid, and then it is sitting there. It's been sitting there with no progress. God says, what are you? And he's saying to Zerubbabel, do these adversaries present a problem to me? Are they something that I can't handle from within my own means and my own character? He says, they will become a plane to you. The opposition by these adversaries, which has been in place for 16 years, will be removed. They will no longer be an obstacle to you. So that's encouraging, but what's even more encouraging is you continue to read verse seven. We read that he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So Zerubbabel himself is gonna bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace. The top stone, as we can imagine, is the last stone that is put in place in the temple as it's being constructed. And that signifies the end of the task, that the rebuilding will be complete. And that's encouragement for the Jew because the temple, again, the foundation's been sitting there bare for 16 years. But notice the word shouts there. And this is really important for us to understand what's being said with shouts. This is gonna help us understand that all of the Jews are gonna know exactly what's going on. This is a loud speaking. And I want us to imagine that we're at a football game and you're at a, you're at a stadium and one of the teams scores and you're standing outside of the stadium and you hear this big euphoric swell of noise. You don't really hear any specific words because everybody is shouting and they're all shouting different things, but you hear this rise in volume. It's a cheering, but that's not what's being spoken of here. What's being spoken of here is something more of a chanting where everybody is speaking in unison and they have a clear understanding of the content of what's being said. And so the focus here is on unified speaking by all the people. The people know the content and they speak it together. And what they're speaking of is very, very clear for us. And what that is, is grace. When we think of grace, we think of our New Testament. We think of Ephesians chapter one. We think of plenty of other places. It is by grace we are saved. But this word has its origin in the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew word hen. And this grace is exactly what we know it to be in the New Testament. It was the Old Testament version of it. It is kindness towards one in whom the giver of that kindness takes great pleasure. So the giver of kindness has great pleasure towards one, and he expresses that by granting kindness to them. So God is saying to Zerubbabel, when I enable you to finish this temple, and it's me who's going to enable you to do that, you will recognize that it was me who made you able to finish this. But I wasn't just working on your behalf, but rather I am fulfilling my covenant promise to you. And that is what Israel will come to understand but the flattening of the ground, the removal of these mountains also helps us understand something else that's taking place here. And all that has to do with preparation for Christ himself. 70 years later, Malachi was speaking, approximately 70 years after the time of Zechariah. Malachi chapter three, verse one. This is gonna be a reference to Christ's earthly ministry, his first appearance. Malachi 3, one, behold, I am gonna send my messenger and he will prepare the way before him. This is 
prophecy about John the Baptist coming and preparing the way for Christ in his earthly ministry. We know all about that. Now let's back up 180 years before the time of Zechariah. Isaiah is speaking, and he's talking about the same type of thing, but this time about Christ's millennial appearance and Christ's millennial reign, his second coming. Isaiah 40, verse 4. And listen to the references to the valleys that are brought up and the mountains that are brought down as I read this. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of Yahweh will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. So this is all suggesting Christ for us. There is a preparation for Christ for his earthly ministry by John the Baptist. There is a geological preparation for Christ that will be coming at the time of his millennial ministry. Let's read verses 8 and 9 together back in our passage, and we'll see a little bit more about what's taking place. God says, The word of Yahweh came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. God is clear that grace is going to give you success. There's going to be no more 16-year work stoppages here. Uh, Zerubbabel will not only resume the work, but he himself will actually finish the work. He will be on the job the whole time and he will finish it. And then he says, this is how Israel will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. The completion of the temple will guarantee Christ's millennial return. That must have been encouraging to the Jew to know that Christ will return and the way we will know that he will return is that the same man that begins the reconstruction or resumes it, he's the guy who's going to finish the job. And the joy and the shouting that will accompany that finishing will be really, really great in the time of Israel, in the time of Zechariah. But it will be a foreshadowing of the joy of Israel when Christ comes again in his millennial reign. So all of that is really, really good news, but there was a problem. And the problem here is among the Jews, and we see that in verse 10. We see, for who has despised the day of small things? And there were some among the Jews, and was especially the older people, who were cynical about the rebuilding of the temple. They were cynical about it when they saw the foundation. Let's turn in our Bibles to Ezra chapter 3, and we'll see that. We'll see that cynicism amongst the older people. And the setting here is that the foundation of the temple is being laid, and we see the response of the people. And you'll see that there's a mixed response, but I want us to focus on the negative part of that mixed response. Ezra 3.12, Yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's households, the old men who had seen the first house of Yahweh, they were weeping with a loud voice when the foundation of the house was laid. The reason why these older men were weeping when they saw the foundation of Zerubbabel's temple was because they could remember the grandeur of Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple was really impressive. It was bright, it was white, it was clean, it was perfect, it was large, it had a huge courtyard. It had all of these things outside of the temple that were designed to, to prepare Israel to come into God's presence. And it was to be an example to the rest of the world. And Israel was not faithful with that, but it was a really, really impressive temple. And here we see that the men are looking at this and they have disdain for this because it's so small. They were weeping, looking at this, saying, oh, we have such a poor, pitiful temple now. But what was most evident to these men was not that God was restoring his presence in Jerusalem. What was most obvious to these older men was that, that um, the temple itself was unimpressive in comparison to Solomon's temple. So they were seeing a negative aspect of this, and they were very public about this. There was open weeping about this. But we see that God has an answer to that in verse 10 as we keep reading. God says, these seven will be glad when they hear the plumb line and they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of Yahweh which roam to and fro throughout the earth. This is God's answer. These seven is a reference back to last week, chapter 3, verse 9. The stone that symbolizes the Messiah that has seven eyes on it. Those eyes here, God tells us, are roaming to and fro throughout the earth. This is Christ. He's looking. 
This is Zerubbabel. He's holding the plumb line. The plumb line is what you hold at the top. It's a weighted string. It holds down. It helps you keep the, the wall straight. It's, it's a guide for your construction. What God is telling Zerubbabel here is some of these men, they may come to their own conclusions. Maybe they're coming to those conclusions based on their own limited understanding and their own distorted perspective of things, their own fallen perspective of things. But God himself is glad when he sees his perfect plans coming to fruition in his design and his way. And incidentally, we know from Ezra chapter 5 that the temple was indeed finished. It was finished about four years later. So what this should do for us is we look at this and we see the Jews, they're getting pretty excited. Oh, wow, the temple is being finished. What that tells us is that Christ is going to return. We should be full of the same joy and the same anticipation that Christ actually is returning. Because if God gives that guarantee to the Jew, that has implications for us. And Paul gives examples of that in two places at least in his letters to the churches in the New Testament. I want us to turn to a couple of them. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What we're going to see here is how excited and how eager this church was for the return of Christ. And this is a church that has all kinds of problems. They've got divisions in the church. Some are following Paul. Some are following Apollos. But 1 Corinthians 1, 7 tells us something that they were doing that was right. And that is that they were eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The rest of the world looking at them could see all of these problems. But the one thing they could see that was right and good was they were awaiting Christ. And how were they awaiting? They were awaiting eagerly. And then Paul also writes to the church in Thessalonica. He wasn't able to spend a lot of time with them. But he spent enough time with them to establish the church. And he is writing later to commend them on a number of things at the end of chapter 1 in 1 Thessalonians. He commends them for two things. First, he says, I'm commending you because you turned from gods and foreign gods and idols to serve the true God. So you turned to God. But then he says in verse 10, you turned to wait for his son from heaven. So this is a church where the testimony of that church has gone out throughout the Mediterranean world. And the testimony of them, among other things, is they are waiting for Christ. So God provides a sufficient grace for all that he has ordained, and it will come to pass. But this vision also foretells of something third, and that tells us there is a coming king. So let's read verses 11 through 14. And Zechariah, we're going to notice, has a question. And he starts by saying, what are these? He's got good information from the angel about everything that's been Given so far, he's asking about the lampstand and all about the lampstand, but he didn't get any clarity on the purpose of these trees. So he, he asks about them, and that's what the, the discourse is about in verses 11 through 14. He says, Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? And I answered a second time and said to him, What are these two olive branches? which are beside the two golden pipes, which empty the golden oil from themselves. So he spoke to me saying, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of all of the earth. We're going to walk through several pieces of this part of the vision to make sure we've got clarity on what's being said here. We'll notice in verse 11 first that Zechariah makes reference to trees. These are cultivated olive trees. These are the source of the oil. All of the oil that ends up flowing into that bowl that we saw that sits above the golden lampstand originates from the tree itself. So when Zechariah makes reference to the tree in verse 11, he's speaking of the, the entity that is the source of the oil. And again, there's two trees, one on one side and one on the other, like we had in our picture. Those are the source of the oil. But then in verse 12, he mentions branches. And in Hebrew here, it's not talking about the tree, the structure of the tree. Whatever this is drawing attention to here is actually the end of the branch. And it's the means by which the oil comes out of the tree and into those golden pipes. So in Zechariah's vision, he sees this oil that's coming from the trees. And the branches that he describes here in verse 12 are the means by which the oil is gathered together and begins to flow towards that bowl. And it flows towards that bowl through these golden pipes, which we also see in verse 12. And the Hebrew, again, is, is clear here. This is a conduit for the oil. And they're golden pipes. 
So their purpose was to transfer the oil from the tree to the bowl. That's what their purpose was. And they were made out of gold. And then in verse 12, we also learn and we also see that the oil itself is golden. So the pipes are golden. The oil is golden. And they're golden just like the rest of the lampstand. And all of this points to God's presence. But the production and the delivery of the oil, I want us to, to see this and understand this, has to do with the same presence and the glory of the lampstand itself because of the color of gold that we see here. And notice in verse 12 that the branches empty the oil from themselves. The oil is not being taken from anything beyond the tree. It's coming from the tree, and the tree is delivering from itself. Those branches are delivering it. So the tree delivers the oil from itself. And this points to one and only one thing for us. We need to see this, and that is that the mediator or the deliverer of God's glory must possess the same glory as God does himself. And so theologically, we have here God's glory being dispersed throughout the world as we think of the millennial kingdom. But the means by which that glory is dispersed throughout the world must possess the same glory as that glory that's being dispersed. And that points to Christ himself. So in our last vision, the vision that we had in last week in Joshua the priest, he described the priestly role of Jesus. That is Jesus petitioning for those chosen ones He was petitioning on their behalf before the Father. That was the priestly role of Jesus. Here we see the kingly role of Jesus. What the king does is he doesn't petition before before God on behalf of the people, but rather he mediates God's glory to the people. And that is what we have here. Last week we had Zerubbabel, we had had Joshua the priest. This week we have Zerubbabel, uh, the governor, who's in the kingly line of Jesus. So we have an application for ourselves that we need to think of carefully here as we think about this. And that is, what is your anticipation of Christ? This is a a unique book. It's not a well-known book. But the idea of Christ's return is throughout our New Testament as well. You don't have to read very far in your New Testament before you come to the, the reality that Christ is returning again. What is your anticipation of him? It's pretty easy to get lost in the hubbub of our, our daily and our weekly activities and responsibilities, and some of them are really hard. But do you have some means by which you remind yourself that Christ is coming again? And this world system that we live in, as broken as it is, as much grace as God gives us to function in this world as a church and members of the body of Christ, this will all be replaced and overrun by Christ himself and his glory pervading to the world. So just examine yourself and ask yourself to what degree are you informing yourself about that and growing in your anticipation and your thirst for Christ's return. I know that I need to grow in that area as well. That's something that I I want to see grow in my life in the coming weeks and months. Next, we're going to look at the vision of the flying scroll. And we need to remember back to vision number three, where the man had the measuring rod in his hand, and he's going to measure Jerusalem. The message there was that Christ was going to dwell among his people, among his faithful people. But what that vision did not address was what was God's plan for the people who were not faithful? And that's what this vision is all about. The flying scroll is God's plan to judge the rebellious sinner and has everything to do with God's law. But before we look at this vision, we need to keep in mind that one characteristic about God is that he's a holy God. And it's very important for us to understand that a holy God judges every last offense against him. And that is what is ultimately right and good. That is a good thing. God simply would not be good if he did not avenge himself against every offense against him. We need to remember that in our limited capacity as created beings, we really don't understand the idea of an infinite offense against an infinitely holy God. And so we're going to read this vision all at once. We're going to read it full front to back. And as we do, let's pay particular attention to what is said about the scroll, both in its dimensions and in its activity, what the scroll does. So this is the sixth vision. Then I lifted up my eyes again, and I saw, and behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see a flying scroll, its length and width, 20 cubits. Then he said to me, This is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole land. 
Surely everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side, and everybody who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. I will make it go forth, declares Yahweh of hosts, and it will enter into the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name, and it will spend the night within that house and consume it with its timber and its stones. So the first thing we need to keep in front of us here is that God has a perfect standard. He starts this vision by saying, and behold, a flying scroll. This scroll is flying. It's above the ground. And it's actually flying. So that tells us that this scroll is active. Zechariah sees a very active agent that is working here. But the next thing we need to notice as we look at verse 2 is that the scroll actually has dimensions. And the only way that a, a scroll can have dimensions is if it is unrolled, if it is unfurled. We don't give the dimensions of a scroll that's, that's rolled up. And this is significant for us because this tells us that God's law and God's ways can be read and that they are knowable. Hebrews chapter one opens with God having spoken to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days he has spoken to us in son. We learn that God spoke to the, to the people of Israel through the prophets. He spoke to them in many portions and he spoke to them in many ways. What that tells us is that there was nothing vague. There was nothing unclear about God's word. They knew all of this. And because of that, God expected his people to know his word and he expected them to teach his word to their, one another. And we see that as we think back to Deuteronomy chapter six, we hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. What were they to do regarding God's commandments and God's instructions? They were to teach them diligently to their sons. They were to bind them on their foreheads. They were to write them on the doorposts of their houses. God's word was to be in front of them all the time. It was to be known and understood and thought. And so God's word was abundantly clear to the Jew. But not only was every Jew to know that God's word was there and it was clear, every Jew needed to know that God's law itself was perfect. In Psalm 19, the psalmist writes, the law of Yahweh is perfect. And in its perfection, it restores the soul. God told his people that obedience to his law was the entry point of fellowship with him. Psalm 19, the same psalm, read a few verses farther in verse 11, speaking of God's judgments, again, which is relating to the totality of God's law. God says, moreover, by them, your slave is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So there is great reward in keeping God's law. It's not vague, it's not unclear. They knew exactly what it meant. So the Joe had no reason to believe that God's law was optional or inferior in any way. It was perfect, it was a knowable standard, it was right there in front of them. And there were blessings that come from obeying it. But the Jew also knows that there were curses that came for disobeying this. When God was telling Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 28, of all of the blessings that would come upon them, he spent 15 verses describing those blessings if they would keep the, his law. But then he spends the rest of the chapter, I think more than 45 verses, explaining how it was that they would incur curses if they would not obey his law. So the first thing we need to see from this vision is that God's law and his standard is perfect. And there are blessings that come from obeying it, and there are curses that come from disobeying it. But as we keep reading, we're going to learn that that judgment is a permanent judgment. When judgment or curses come, God says eventually that judgment will be permanent. And we see that in verse 3. In verse 3, Zechariah helps, is helped by the angel to understand something that's important, and that is that this vision is about a curse. We see that. It says, this is the curse. Everyone who sins will be purged away. So the curse has to do with a purging away. And we'll get to the idea of purging here in a minute. But let's take a look at the curse itself. A curse is invoking divine harm for failure to keep a covenant. And this is not something you can bear up under. This is not something you can learn to live with. This is divine harm. It's weighty. It's unbearable. It is eternal. It is a permanent judgment. So the angel now has Zechariah's attention and he tells him about the scope of the judgment. He says, this curse is going forth over the face of the whole land. 
And in Hebrew, when they talk about the face, a lot of times they're talking about the full dimension, the full reaches of an area. It's the whole land, it's the surface. Every Jew in Zechariah's day knew that they were going to be measured by God's law. And in the millennial kingdom, all of God's people, not only the Jews, but all the Gentiles, every person is in view here. And so the angel reiterates that point by saying everyone is in view here. All of mankind is subject to this. There is a comprehensive judgment that is going to come against all of sinful man. So God's point curse has to do with the offenses against stealing and swearing. We see those that are listed here. There's a specific mention made of stealing and swearing. And God's point is not that he only cares about those two sins. These two sins are representative of two categories of sins. One is a category of sin that is against man, first and foremost, and ultimately against God because we're disobeying man's and God's instructions about our fellowship with one another. And there's a second category of sins that God gives us that are related to transgressions against God himself and our relationship with him. So what Zechariah is, is seeing here is that God has all sin is an offense against him, but some of it manifests itself by breaking God's instructions about our relationships with one another. And some of it has to do with breaking our, God's instructions about our relationships with him. But the curse itself is a purging. And to purge something is to make sure that something is emptied. And this is important for us to get because this helps us understand what God is getting at here. And as it relates to sin, purging is something that, that has the idea of something being cleansed away. And it's not cleansing something. What it's doing is it's removing something so that what remains after that one thing is removed may be clean. So God's talking about the purging here is the removal of those things that are sinful. And so the, the takeaway here is that the guilty will be eliminated from the world and they will be cut off from God's blessings. So what we see about this is that God's judgment is permanent. It's comprehensive. We need to understand that. But there's one more aspect to God's judgment. And we see that in verse 4. And that is that it is inescapable. It's an inescapable judgment. And this is one of the most sobering things we can read about in God's Bible. And that is his final judgment of sin and man's rebellion against him. It's important as we see this that we grow in our reverence for God, a holy and a God that must be feared. We see that God is speaking about it here in our, in our passage. He's speaking about the curse. When you see the word it there, it refers to the curse. He's talking about his judgment against sin. God will make it go forth. And what God is saying is that this curse is going to go forth. This judgment is going to go forth. It is imminent. And it's being held for the day of wrath that God has appointed. And Zechariah is describing the day that this curse is released and it will go forth. And God says, I will make it go forth. This is the day where God unleashes the wrath that is due to man who thought that God had not kept track of his sin, who thought that God would not remember his sin, that he would get away with his sin, that his sin would go unpunished. We read that God explains exactly how this will take place. It will enter into the house. Man is good at hiding sins in his own home. All of us know this. We know this. Our own homes are the place where we let our collar down and we, we do what we want to do. What God is showing us here is that the curse will enter into the house. This is where we get the idea that this is not a, an escapable curse. This is not something you can escape from. It is inescapable. But notice also that it spends the night within the house. And what's in view here is duration. God has a duration in mind for this curse and a duration that is similar or sufficient for God to pour out the full extent of his wrath. God is saying the outpouring of my wrath will occur over a period of time. And so all of my wrath will be poured out against this. But not only will it, it exact its vengeance on the individual who's a sinner, but look at what it does to the house itself. It will consume the house with its timber and its stones. These are the materials that the homes were made of in that time. And so what we see is that not only does God judge the sinner and the sinner absorbs God's wrath, but his dwelling is obliterated. It's altogether removed. And so there's no record of the man and his sin. That was what his God is going to do when his son Jesus Christ comes in his millennial kingdom. It is hard to think of a more complete permanent judgment than this. So God has given us a perfect standard 
And his judgment for those who don't adhere to that standard is a complete judgment. We may look at ourselves and we say, well, I've done these things. I have stolen, I have cursed, I have done all of these things, and I've done worse than that. What does that mean for me? Do I have this judgment in view for me? Is that what I'm waiting for? I want us to read some verses from the New Testament that are very, very encouraging for us. What we need to see here as we turn to Galatians chapter 3 is that Christ takes the place. He actually takes the curse for us. This is beautiful. These are sweet words to the Christian. Christ redeemed us, Galatians 3.13, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In verse 14, we see the purpose for this in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. There is a blessing that is coming to everybody who places their trust in Christ, the Christ who became a curse for them. This is the gospel. Messiah Jesus is taking the place of everybody who would put their trust in him, the trust that they cannot bear up under God's wrath. They cannot satisfy God's wrath. They need a perfect substitute, and that perfect substitute is Christ himself. And the good news for the believer is, as we look at the idea of swearing and of stealing, when you read it in the Hebrew, it's talking about an ongoing activity. It's an ongoing activity that not only is ongoing, but it's unbroken. And, and that is to point out the fact that the people that are being in view here are the people where there is no fight against their sin. So our sin can make the Christian sometimes want to put ourselves in that category. I'm just like everybody else because I still have this, this sin within me. It's very important that we understand that the person who has trusted Christ is regenerated by the Holy Spirit, even though we feel the weight of our sin. Let's turn a, a few pages forward. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 17. One of the most important things for us to understand as we consider our own sin is the mixed condition that a believer is in. Notice the, the opposition that the flesh and the spirit have to one another as I read this. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition to one another so that you do not do the things that you want. The thing I want to draw our attention to here, more important than anything else, is that the spirit sets itself against the flesh. If a spirit is in you, it is setting itself against the flesh, and it's producing a fight within you, Christian. And so that's the assurance for the Christian. When there is a fight against sin, even though it's, it's not a battle that you've won and you've completely removed sin from your life, the fight against sin is the evidence that you are not in the same category as the people that are being described in Zechariah's vision here. And here's the ultimate assurance for the Christian in Romans chapter 8, verse 13. If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the practices of the body, you will live. That's encouraging for the believer, truly encouraging. So while Zechariah's sixth vision speaks about God's judgment that is coming for the unbeliever, there is great hope for the believer who is actively battling against the progress of sin in their life. So I have two points of application for us before we close. The first is, does sin run unchecked in your life? Read these verses again, read the passage, and, and feel the weight of your sin. But know that God offers salvation. Um, if sin is running unchecked in your life, know that there is a solution, and that solution is Christ. He will take your place if you will submit to his lordship in your life. He will take your place in God's system of justice. Second point of application is, do you know the realities of grace? Romans chapter 6, the same grace that saves you is the grace that enables you to walk in newness of life. Tyler mentioned this earlier. Ben mentioned this as well during our communion. We're united with Christ in his death, so we died to our old nature. But we're also united with Christ in his resurrection. And just as Christ was raised from the dead, the believer has the ability to walk in newness of life. Make sure you know the realities of grace, the grace that saves you, the grace that allows you to live a sanctified life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the privilege that we have of seeing that you do have a purpose for this world. You do have a plan for the future, and that plan is rooted in your son. Your son coming to establish his rule and his reign on this earth.
and to make everything right. I pray for us. Lord, I pray that you would make us ones who truly do thirst and anticipate and yearn for the longing and the return of your son. Lord, grant us grace, your grace, to walk in newness of life. Lord, such that we can put on display your grace to us, to the world around us. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.